Okay, now, I never really paid attention to how it's pronounced. I feel it's, it's a really long name. John A, or hold up, how, is, how do I do this? It's uh, John A. Degos, John D. A. Degos. How do you say your name? John, John A. John A. Degos. Degos. John I'm not going to inform him that I'm mispronouncing my, my last name. <laughs> it's Dutch, and I'm, I'm apparently pronouncing it, but it's the way I was raised was with it. So I, I go with the, the American nation, Digo. Goes. Okay. And now there's a slight echo, but we, we could get past it. Okay. So, like, as I said earlier before I hit the record button, there's a, a couple of items I was really interested in. But maybe I should first just start off with i think you hit my radar i think i messaged you like two years ago and then i just never followed up um and i'm like, glad you finally did thank you for reaching out again yeah, yeah. oh yeah yeah I, I made my declaration to learn functional programming i think in 2015 late 2015 i made my declaration i was getting so bored um yeah. with with writing c sharp code or with doing object oriented programming but i think tightly coupled to that i was getting frustrated with working with object oriented programmers before i really <laughs> before i really realized that regardless of if it's english japanese portuguese yeah. um choosing a language is choosing the people that you can associate with and That's that right. didn't really dawn on me until i started going full throttle into specifically the F sharp um, language and and being participating in the F sharp camp. And that's when like, wow, like I enjoy like, I mean, I haven't really worked with someone on the F sharp project, but usually they know way more than I do. And I, I just love to learn, you know, no matter who it comes from. Yes. And um, I, I've often stated that learning of sharp has pretty much made me unemployable because <laughs> even in my even in my interviews they were like well scott do you have a problem um just doing straight c sharp and i hesitate and i say well i recognize it as something that learned from the lessons of of c sharp i mean f sharp learn learns from the lessons of c sharp and yeah. i feel like it's just a better language for some of the things that we can just not have to deal with. So hence, I'm, in, I'm even pickier when it comes to where I work. So I spend probably about four to six months being unemployed, but always practicing. <laughs> so that's Good. a little bit of my background. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious what your background was. Like, how, when, when did you actually transition from, from OOP or did you just automatically just start off doing Scala or some form of FP? I'm writing uh, software for, for way too long here, uh, probably 25 plus years. And I got my start writing basic in C and then C++. And so I was writing procedural code for quite some time. And then I discovered Java and I'm like, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> We got, we got objects there and virtual methods and a garbage collector. You have to free the memory you're allocating. And uh, then generics came along and I'm like, wow, C never had, had any of this stuff. And so I, so I was quite in, quite in love with oriented program, programming. And I, I just can remember being, being so excited to write Java. I'll get up in the morning, write Java. Not a lot of people say that these days. days. <laughs> but, but compared to C and basic and uh, Fortran, all the languages I had worked, worked with, with Java was a, a lot more rating. And so I really fell in love with object-oriented programming and agile and driven development development and all that stuff. It, it, it was a big help for me. And I did that for a number of years. And then slowly, bit by bit, started working on bigger code bases. And I ran into, into all sorts of problems, like, like the mere act of taking a mutable object and, and handing it off to someone one, and not knowing when, what's going to happen after that point. point. Or... Uh, uh, in Java, this is anti-pattern where you see a lot of things devolving into Java lang object, and just all, all these other little anti-patterns. And bit, and bit by bit, started writing in a more small style. Wow, like I started um, preferring immutable objects and so forth. And then I remember the first time I used recursion, and I thought this looks, looks really nice. It's not a of for loops, like a set of set of equations, and it looks nice and neat, and I can understand it. 
And that got me down the path of functional programming. After I had that experience functionalizing a bit, then I was given the opportunity to come in and build an engineering team for a company in San Francisco and to choose the technology stack. And it had to be, or at least it would, would make it a lot easier if I chose something on the JVM. So I looked and there is two, two obvious choices, Closure and, and uh, Scott. And I thought, well, it has the static types, and I'm more used to that. I'm more used to typing, so I went on. And that was the beginning of a long journey. Sky so didn't program in a functional style very much. I mean, a little, little bit of functional programming, programming here and there. But it took me a while, I think probably four or five years, uh, working with Scala before I, I started doing even, even deeper functional programming and exploring the possibilities and learning in Haskell and in related programming languages. Which is, and like, like yourself, I found that a big draw. I mean, I mean, I, I love functional programming, programming, and it's changed the the way I write software, and uh, it's given me a second life in writing in software. I felt like you've been writing code, code for so long, and just there's only so much you can you can learn when, when you're doing an object of programming. I mean, in Java, there's not like an endless amount amount that you can you stop learning at some point, or at least I I, I stop learning very quickly, quickly. And with functional functional programming, well, it's just very very very. And there's, and there's just much to learn. Every day there's something new to learn. And so that kept me going. Um, and uh, getting in, in, involved in uh, the, uh, the functional side of Scala and learning all this, our, our related I mean, languages and styles, it, it was great. But then, like you say, there's the community aspect to it, it as well. There's a certain, certain type of person who gravitates toward these, these I don't know, new, new ways of, of writing stuff. And I just found a lot of really smart people in the functional program, programming community to learn a lot from. And, and uh, also really excited about uh, writing software. And that was, it's a little contagious. I got thinking around people who are bored with writing software, software and I just sort of, you know, you know write nine to five, five and not interested in learning about things. Then it, it, it tends to sort of rub off on you. But conversely, if you're around people who are, who are super excited and, and passing rappers and uh, just very knowledgeable and excited about what they're doing and excited to learn, learn can rub off too. too. And so I was, was bit by that, that I think, a little bit. And, and I fell in love with, with a lot of the, um, the people in functional programming communities and their open attitude towards thing and their desire to, to learn and desire to improve themselves. They're just a push forward what's possible in software, software development. I think all these uh, co combine together to uh, make me feel like FP is really my, my home now. It's where I belong. I could go out and do Java or C or lots of other programming languages, but I, I really, really feel like functional programming is my home. And it's not a giant community. It, it's, it's not giant, but it's enough that you, you can have a home there and you can find, find jobs in the space. You may have to look longer. Uh, you can find giant jobs in space, and, and uh, there's a number of people doing it. More companies, it seems like every year, turning to some um, phone programming language. So I'm, I'm I'm excited to be here and ex excited to keep because there's always more stuff to learn, and uh, excited to help. I hope hope grow the boundaries of the functional programming community and get more, more people excited in some of the stuff that we're doing. We're doing. That's cool. Were there were there any uh, specific for lack of a better term, like thought leaders, that you appreciated their content when you made the decision to to pick up Scala. Like, did you like, for example, with me, like I probably consume at least four hours a day YouTube, whether I'm preparing for bed or I'm waking up in the morning. I play YouTube when I'm taking a shower, right? Mm -hmm. The only time that like I'm not consuming information like continuously is like when my girlfriend's in town then like I'm a normal person. But besides that, I'm always like just trying to level up. Yeah, awesome. there's, there's a little bit of com uh, competitiveness in me, but like there's some yeah. people that I, I believe that um, have really contributed to my growth within the .NET space, like Scott Vlashen, Mark Seaman, Tomas Petricek. There's a couple of others that I'm sure uh, are not gonna forgive me for doing a shout out, but like just consume, just consuming their their blog posts and their and their videos, and I literally like Google their names, like their name space podcast, um, has really developed 
the the way that I, I look at building systems, especially leveraging like the compiler to do that whole enforcement, or at least to the best of my ability, the whole legal state's unrepresentable. Were there certain people that you really have a, a deep amount of respect for as you were trying to figure out what this FP is? Yeah, so the first first book I read, uh, ostensibly the first book I read on functional functional programming was Odarsky's book on Scala, and I read that uh, on plane trips back and back and forth to San Francisco, and uh, that that helped. Mostly, I saw a new way, new way to do things, and eventually, you know, over time, I, I look back and then say, oh, oh, well, you know, there's there's way to do even more more functional programming than Odarsky showed in the book, but he showed enough to get me hooked. And also, I think that there's an element of, or for, for me at least, there's an element of familiarity in the sort of hybrid, hybrid object-oriented functional programming style that Odersky taught. And it just really, really, um, it, was, it was not too scary. <laughs> it was like different and be interesting and exciting, but, but so different as to be overwhelming and scary. And so that really, really helped get me hooked. And, and then once I, uh, I, that book, I started it reaching out and there were uh actually remember um reading blog post of uh some called chris chris nutty and i ended up ended up hiding him and working with, working with him but yeah i just i just remember reading these early people in the scala scala community were blogging about functional programming and they were going through their own journeys and and um and and following reading what they were working on and and so, and so forth, and watching them learn over the years, and watching myself learn over the years, it's been quite a journey. And, and uh, these I, I I try to uh, new open software and and in papers. So I so I look papers that come out on functional programming, especially papers that are trying to trying to do something in Haskell. Um, and 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 then, and then I. Uh, a few favorite speakers, I, I suppose everyone does, who cover interesting top topics in a exciting, informative way. To follow, try to try to follow on. Okay, you forgive me. I still don't know what a monad is. No matter how many times I look up the definition, no, it, no one, no one really it, knows. It, what a monad and is. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ask you what it is. Um, I saw a funny. Uh, Hitler skit a couple oh. of days ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, I was feeling his pain, mm -hmm. um, but I, I've noticed, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, that you've been investing um, time and attention towards the the side effects of of systems that are built using fun built with functional programming languages. My question is, what really is the challenge um, that that you chose to invest your time in trying to solve, like, in other words, what exactly are you working on um, in in like high level terms, and what piqued your interest about that particular problem within this space? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Question. I think that one of the things. Well, actually, there's two re reasons. Why we're, why we're on functional effects now, now in Opus. One is because at the time, the functional effects systems were just, were just not very good. And if you were to expose them to an, a non-functional programmer, they would look at these functional effects systems and say, hey, why? Why am I wrapping all my code in this AO type type? What is the practical, practical benefit? And you, you you can sell them on referential transparency and local reasoning and all these other other things, but that's that's a long hung hard sell. Because focusing on okay, here's how you you here's how you have to change the way you think about software in order to benefit from the way that you build you build functional programs, and that, and that takes a long time and a lot of development, and it's not easy and obvious how to tie that to, to any business. Name. It's just very far away from from the business things that the program programmer has to do on a daily basis. So, functional effects systems, systems were not good, and they were not easy to sell. Sell, and I thought that they, they could be done a lot better. I thought it could be done so well, well that that people might actually choose to use them, even even if they were not sold on functional programming. I'll, I'll explain it in a second if you want, if you want. But I think that's actually coming. I think the functional contract systems have come 
at least it's still have come so far so fast that there are compelling reason, reasons why businesses would want to want to use them if they're not a fan of, fan of programming. So they've, they've gone from being underpowered and very hard to sell to be actually a pretty, pretty compelling selling point. And then the other reason that I wanted to work in the space space was because just seeing a lot of teams, a lot of individuals, they learn about patch matching and recur recursion. And they're like, yeah, this is cool. It's cool. I, I can see why people like functional programming. But then when they go to build um, the bigger parts of their, of their application, they're like, what do you do here? I, I know what to do here. And so they f fall back into their imperative ways because they are, they're not equipped with the proper tools necessary to make their, their entire app application functional. And that's partly because of the way education has been handled in, in the full programming community. We start small. We start at the bottom of the stack, pack, immutable data and recur and so forth and pattern matching. And then we try to build build up and then like people start down here. So they're left with this mass, massive app of knowledge about, about how to build real world, real world applications using pure fun functional programming. And, and I thought, well, this is the pro problem. What if we were to st start at the other? End? In other words, how you do the big, big stuff? Especially in this day and age, more and more languages are getting pattern matching and more people are familiar with Passing the functional function, like passing the function to, to map on a collect collection array or something like that. So people are are getting concepts because they're being plucked out of the functional pro programming language and put in Java, JavaScript, and all other programming languages. So so you have got that sort of growing awareness of stuff down, stuff down here, and then this massive gap up here. Here, what you started at the, the top and 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 try to drill your way down. Give give people feel for what or what do to solve the big big picture problem. And let them figure out the details on their own over time, and maybe that might be a more um, sticky way, way to get people people to functional programming becoming because it's easy to do FP in the small, and then and then to sort of have no way to scale, scale that up. But if you if, if you approach it from the other side, if they if they can hold, hold the picture piece in their head, head they're working at a high level with FP, then it, eventually I believe that they're they're going to overcome all the difficulties in in the small. That makes sense. Uh, a book that really changed the way that I that I program. There's a couple books. There's a uh, X unit test patterns. I don't know who mm -hmm. the author is, but uh, I read that book in one weekend. Uh, when good I, book, book. Yeah, yeah. Very insightful, and uh, it's just not not to put myself on a pedestal, but whenever I look at other people's unit tests. I just want to provide feedback so so bad. Yeah, yes. Uh, so, but the, another one um, which I I'm pretty sure you probably have heard of at least was uh, domain modeling made functional by Scott Vlashin. Yeah, and so right. there there's there's certain things that are now just, there's certain types that I just use like a yeah. non-MT type. You know, when I know yes. for a fact that there's no way that this this collection or this list can be empty. Um, yeah. But to to go back on what you were saying, I've I've been entertaining this idea of like um, building a specification as a library as itself, where and this is where like I feel as if functional programming just complements domain driven design so well, um, where as you were saying. I went from identifying nouns when when designing a system, you know, this noun is going to have these properties and it's going to have these behaviors to there's a lot more clarity and I'm sure like maybe four years from now I'll evolve to a higher like level, but there's so much clarity when I just focus on starting off with the core operations of this domain, what are the primary operations? that everybody would go to this domain for. Yeah. And as soon as I identify the first operation, I say, okay, well, here's the first operation, here's one of the operations for this domain that it wouldn't make sense if this domain didn't have this operation. In order for this operation to be successful, what does it require and what does it output? Yeah, and yeah. since I've been going at that level of just identifying the operations 
hence yeah. the function type. And then I flush out my language by by identifying the 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 types to serve as the parameters for that operation. The heavens have opened up, you know. What yeah. I mean? <laughs> so, it's a very break. We have solving solving up here. Like here's my object objects, my operations that let me transition things. It's a very al algebraic way of solving the problem. And yeah, yeah, I, like I find it it's eye opening to be able to approach problem solving as what's my do my domain and operations supported by things inside inside that domain. Okay. Yeah. There's a. There's a another um, conference speaker. Uh, I don't know how to say his name. I feel guilty when I say he's an Indian speaker, but he he's a pub he has a published book called uh, I thought it was called like Reactive Pattern. It's it's they use Scala as the language of choice. I have it in my on my shelf, but I forgot his name. Do you know who I'm talking about? De yes. De how do you say his name? Uh, I, I'm not going to venture that. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> okay. Yeah, but I you know, know what I'm talking about. I feel, know, yeah. yeah, I feel guilty because I, I don't know his name, nor can I pronounce it. But that book also had a. I can spell it. I can pronounce it. Yeah, it's like the Bosch something, but um, that book I had to read like a couple times because it's I don't know. It, I'm I'm probably a slower learner than than most people, but when he started talking about looking at your looking at your operations as algebra, you know, and, yes. and mathematically, you know, just describing that. And it, there's no logic, but there's just a type system that compiles. Yeah. And then I do TDD to solidify my my initial um, types that I've identified. I'm doing a lot of talking, I'm sorry, but there's just a lot of oh, stuff. I, that, uh, I, I love where you're going with that. That's one of the most enjoyable things I think when I'm working, working on a problem is figuring out what are those types types, what are the operations on values of those types types I can support and how can I make them, um, how can I boil them down to like the smallest, smallest set of, of operations, each of which has a single responsibility that all let us solve basically all problems inside that mini domain. It's a very, very powerful very way of thinking about this. And it fits into one file. The the, the the algebra for lack of a better term um, mm -hmm. of of just the types that describe the operations and the language that's going to be used in it like I don't have two dozen classes to to represent that you know you could yeah. just look straight at the the signature and say this is what it does assuming that it's pure yeah <sighs> which kind of leads me so to the next trans what's that there's so much so much in an object oriented way of solving that there's just like you know, objects that that's extend objects that skip domain logic or click across a, a whole inheritance hierarchy. Find after doing it the FP, FP way for some years now, I, I just find the OA is, is very difficult to parse, very difficult to understand. Yeah, you know, I find myself in like design sessions where they're using like C sharp and they're they're doing the for let. The, the legacy technique for for modeling out the code, and I just I just just try to keep my mouth shut because I feel like I'm, <laughs> I'm not contributing, you know. Right. So. Don't get in trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you pick and choose your battles. At least, exactly. that's my, and I still lose. Are you doing lean F sharp now? I I am. I'm uh, I'm in between contracts right now, so I'm working on a like a Uber Eats app for the beach. I, I live in Miami Beach, and so. Oh. I I want to build out a proof of concept, and I want to develop some technical know-how on, or at least on demonstrating how to build uh, a, an event sourcing backend. Mm -hmm. So I think that it makes pretty good sense to to take the lessons learned from like how people do ledgers in accounting, and instead of having your your typical your typical uh, CRUD create, read, update, delete, um, for any system that involves money and the delivery of goods, I think yeah, it's a no-brainer now that I have this information that why not record everything as an as an event and play it through a stream. Thing is, is I don't have hands-on experience, and before I start. Um, selling the idea to people that hire me, 
I think that I should at least have hands-on experience and then I don't end up blowing their money on lessons learned. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm doing right now as I'm in between contracts. Right now, was, I've only been working on the client, but sooner or later, the reason why I'm reading closure is I'm, I'm trying to like figure out a new paradigm to complement my, my statically type functional programming yeah. skill set. So I would like to at least attempt it in closure, um, yeah. get, get the scars from doing it. How is that F sharp to closure? I, I've only, I'm on my second book. I have not written any closure code at all. Okay. But uh, one is with F sharp, I try to like harness the REPL as part of my workflow. It just didn't work for me. I think I would probably have to pay for a workshop to see what everybody else is talking about. I essentially, I think F-sharp is awesome when it comes to like um, writing automated tests. One is they they have, for lack of a better term, symbols that you can wrap your sentences in. So gone are the days of camel casing or underscores. You can write out a sentence that represents your test. Yeah. And so it's just more readable. Um, also, when I'm not testing a view model, and I'm just testing a specific function within my domain, my domain library, I find that I don't have to write uh, comments for the various stages of a test. Yeah. Set up, uh, test, verify, and if there's some funky state, like if it's an integration test, tear down. I find mm -hmm. that in functional programming, when I'm doing idiomatic and I'm not doing an object oriented like view model or controller, but I'm literally doing yeah. like a pure function. I don't have to write those stages. It kind of reads already as a script as I do yeah. pipelines. Yeah, so yeah. that's, that's been my experience. Uh, but to answer your question, closure is it's very alien to me, but there's yeah. so many people that know Scala and closure yeah. that almost all of them are advocating closure and I just can't ignore that. So right. I'm taking it upon myself to to at least learn why they they're advocates of it. Yeah. Oh yeah, that, it's it's a powerful, ele elegant, and simple lingu language. It's it can do something, I think. Which leads me to this question: Have you had? I know you're working on a lot of things, and you've been speaking on at a lot of conferences and people. Some people that have no name whatsoever, you still do charity work and, and give them an hour of your time. Uh, have you had any time to invest in, in learning the, the the alternative paradigm in FP, specifically dynamic? No, I've done I've done dynamic program programming before, but in other other languages, JavaScript and PHP, and Python and Ruby, so forth. But but um, I've done any significant programming in one of the one of the Lisps. I played around with Common Lisp for a while. Um, and I've done some some examples in like clo closure back when I was looking at Scala versus closure, but I've I've not had a chance to go deep. I think. Okay. Because what I consistently hear is they're able to prototype a lot faster and make discoveries without the type system getting in their way. I, I hear that repeatedly. I don't know what that feels like, and so. Uh, yeah, I felt that way working in dynamically type programming language, this, that I would be able to program a lot, lot faster. Also, I think that, that dynamic programming languages are just vast, vastly superior meta meta programming. So, so basically, there's almost almost never any situation in a good dynamically typed pro programming language in which you feel like you're writing in boilerplate you can't get get rid of because you because you can just write, do some some meta programming, and and it's going to generate the stuff that you formerly had had to include in boilerplate. And there's just a lot of boiling in language languages like well Scala and Sharp and F F Sharp and so that you can't really, you can't figure out a way to extract and that's because the duplication does not happen at the level of values and 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 these languages don't have tools to operate at, at the level of expressions so you're left with all this boiler crap and and there's not a whole lot, lot that you can do other than code code gen. Or, in some cases, you can use type level program. Very few cases, cases, but it, all those solutions are not very satisfying. And then in the dynamically type programming languages, it's just so easy. Like like you could just, you basically end up, you end up like generating the code <laughs> in your programming language. Effectively, that's effectively what what the meta programming allows you to do. It's very very powerful. Although I think the flip side is like, I actually think that 
small teams, teams and small projects can be way more productive in dynamically type programming languages. Um, I think if, if they reach a certain size, size, like if you're getting up to the point where you have hundreds of developers on a code code base, um, then, then I think it, it, it it can be difficult to scale the dynamic type programming languages to that degree. Millions Static of lines type languages. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Clearly, we we fail with static type programming languages at the scale. <laughs> I think the problem is the problem is is even for dynamic type programming languages because while you can do meta programming, I mean, and so forth, then there's just a lot more stuff to keep track of up in your head because you don't have a compiler there there to help you. That sounds good. Let me see. What else I have on my, my outline? I uh, you already talked about your projects. I feel I feel as if, and I'm curious what your 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 opinion is. I feel as if we're on the cusp of like a transition. I don't think our industry is in a transition, but I feel as if we're like beginning to to gravitate or not even gravitate. I believe as if our industry is beginning to accept that there's alternative ways of, of building, and I, I like to use this word, sustainable software. Um, there's, there's more middle managers and there's more lead developers that no longer ask what is F Sharp or what is Scala, now they ask, why did you decide to learn F Sharp? Why did you, well, F Sharp is still pretty small compared to Scala. They asked, why did you, what made you want to learn, you know, Haskell? What made you want to learn Scala? And they're, they're no longer asking you what it is. Recruiters are asking what it is, but uh, some of the decision makers, uh, when it comes to these software shops, they're now asking why, they're not asking what, which I yeah. think is progress. Has that been your experience, or is there? I think that's that's true. I think we're we're reaching a point of sort of collectiveness that people do they do see other other programming languages as that like F Sharp and Scala and and even and even Haskell, and they know what they're about. And some sometimes they do wonder why why did you invest the time to learn this, or why are you looking for this this type of position, or why do you, why do you want to introduce Haskell into the code base, or whatever it might be. be. But there's there's awareness. That there are different ways to write software. There are people, people who are not knowledgeable of these different ways. And, and these are actually viable programming languages is still production systems in. Like no one questions is that F sharp is a viable production language to build large software in. In the same same way, I mean, there's a, still a little bit of question marks around Haskell. Uh, there shouldn't be an opinion. Haskell has proven itself. And, and there's no question marks around Scala. So the question marks have gone, gone away. And people, people are more stage of okay, yes, it's possible, it can be done. Why? Why should we? Um, it's not a, it's not a mystery, and, and there are no question marks other than other than the sort of right question. Um, and that's good. That's good. That's best, I think. So here's my question to you: Is I have sometimes I feel guilty, sometimes I feel like it's a necessary evil, but every time I. I commit F sharp code to a C sharp code base. <laughs> I feel like I'm sending in a Trojan and that they're going to have to deal with that code that I pushed in there. Um, I, I have a little bit of ego. I'm like, well, this code is self-contained and that there's not really, I can't see you finding that many issues with this F sharp because it's so like small and, and contained, I, I can't see you finding a lot of anomalies with, with the code that that I snuck in here. Um, but the the guilt trip that I have is I'm a consultant, and so like I'm I'm not going to be here to maintain it. I'm not going to be here to look after it. But then, you know, like a like like a criminal, I try to justify why I did it. Like, no, I'm doing you guys a favor. You should at least be looking at different ways of solving a problem, and you should thank me for injecting this this functional code. So at least you're familiar with it. And thanks yeah. to me, maybe you'll be able to make some more money because now you you can put that on your resume that you maintain, you know, I don't know, uh, 500 lines of F sharp, yes. 
twenty thousand line, you know, mobile yeah. app or something. Yeah. What are your thoughts about people like me that sneak F sharp code in there without asking permission, and then <laughs> deal with the consequences later? Forgiveness over permission. Right. You know, that's many times times that you have to. I think back is forgive forgiveness over permission because well, the people that ask permission for don't understand the consequences. This is the technical consequences of use of using one technology versus versus another. Really don't. And so, so I think it's up to each to each one of us professionals to, to decide: is this the point at which we want to introduce functional programming? I mean, and I, I did, did that I, myself. <laughs> I remember working for the big chain food restaurant chain here in America on a contract and I was given a Java, Java and what I returned was functional Java only. <laughs> and that's quite different than normal, normal looking oriented Java, but it did, did the job. And as contractors, I think we, we are paid to, to get the done. I think we have a lot more freedom to choose our technology and to choose uh, the way we, we implement than employees used to. So I think, you know, someone's, Someone else, they brought out us in to solve solve a hard problem. So we go in there and we solve it the best way, best way we know. How. And if that happens to involve all functional programming, then it should all functional programming. That's the best way, best way we know how. And also, also you can think you're opening space at that company for a future F sharp programmer. One may see that F sharp code and be like, like, yeah, we should do more of this. And so you may be responsible single handed for introducing F sharp into an organization. I've seen stuff like that happen. I've seen Haskell get introduced, almost sneaked in for a web, for web service. And it, and it went so like it worked. The web service went, it did its job, it didn't go down, it didn't consume much memory or CPU. And, and that expanded the number of use case inside the company. So who's what you're starting? starting. You may be in companies it's all around the US, the F, F sharp code, code bases. Yeah, well, also with the argument that they, they're they attracting someone that has a different perspective, right? Yeah. And I don't know, like for the business, I kind of like, there's sometimes where I have a guilt trip because the business, they they just want people to be able to maintain even if it's slop, and I think a lot of the stuff is slop, yeah. they want someone to maintain that slop. And uh, they don't really care about self-expression, right? I, right. I, to me, like, I, I take pride in my work. It's a, this is the yeah. way I, I express how my mind shapes this problem and, and provides a solution. Yeah. But they don't, they don't care about that. They just want to save a lot of money. Well, if they want to save a lot of money, then they would reconsider the, the, the people that they hire and the, the technologies that they use. I think there's just, which is kind of transitioning into a different part of the conversation now is like, do, if, if every business is now some form of an IT shop or software shop, which I don't know if you agree with or not, uh, but it's something that I don't think they can ignore at least most of them. Yeah. Then, how do I want to frame this? Do they understand the consequences of continuing to do business as usual with languages that we know have concerns that we know require a lot more discipline? I would argue. Hence, uh, no reference exceptions. Um, I'll just use that one as a prime example. Oh yeah, and the other one is languages that just don't lend themselves well for testability and how you have to have a lot of discipline or, or rigor to write testable code Yeah, yeah. by default. Um, is, is there any more that we can do for the people that run the software shops that are clearly not developers. Is there anything you would recommend that can shift them into looking at technology as something that helps them, right? And 
really like, we're, we're dealing with proven languages, right? They're like 20 years old right now. If you talk about Java and C sharp yeah. and there's a lot of people that know it. A lot of people, you're not going to run out of developers. The question is, are they creating more fires? Are you, are you hiring more saviors than you are people that deliver you hell of money and save you hell of money? Uh, and I'm sorry, I can't articulate it the way that I would like to, but hopefully you, you get where I'm trying to ask. Like, is there anything that it, what else can we do to, to steer decision makers into upgrading their technology in which I believe that is going to reduce maintenance costs? I really do believe that. Absolutely. Is there anything that you think we could do? I, I think it's I think it's very tough. And I think it's it's tough because a lot of people who are, who are making decisions not technologists at heart and they don't they don't have and even when they are their knowledge of technology com comes from back when they were they were coder 20 years ago ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago and and so it's very much divorced and it's very tied into a specific set of languages and ecosystem choices is and honestly i just think that small programming i mean does save money it does result in more maintainable code it cuts down on the number of runtime errors in an application um, it, um, it gives people good good tools for designing testable apis that can be refactored safely there's a lot of great tangible benefits to the business for small programming i mean telling them on that on the other is a little harder because Ultimately, what they would like is a bunch of case studies by Microsoft, by Google, or whatever, that just that just choose these technologies and, you know, developers do this and suddenly your productivity will be higher. But, but no, it's funny that kind of work, work and it's super hard, hard to get any kind of money in a university to fund that type of research. Very expensive, very hard to conduct these type of studies. So, so it's not being done. And that's... That, that's a problem. Basically, means that that um, the, the loudest, biggest voices in the ecosystem are going to be dominating the technology choices at these companies that are that are not chief by technologists. And that means like like I've heard of Ruby on, on Rails. That was a thing. Thing like name recognition. Ruby on Rails drove drove a lot of people to choose Ruby. They're like, oh, well, we can, can hire Rails developers. And the reality is it was a lot harder than they than they actually if you choose something like Haskell or, or F sharp, there's gonna be develop, developer lining up to up to work company. And and you may not have to pay them as competitively as you know, Go programmers or whatever. It's, it's something there's just a, just a big, 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 big companies, massive amounts of uh, ability to hire huge numbers numbers of pros. It, it actually makes more sense for these, these smaller shops to choose a niche programming language because because they're going to have much easier time, time hiring and then they're going to attract the type of type of person who cares about these technologies deep enough to, to learn a new language and so it, it's it absolutely makes makes there's a this case that can that can be made for uh, specifically for small small ops to invest in more programming and other sort of niche languages like that they're going to have to have quality software easier hiring they're going to have to compete with, with Google salaries and so forth. Um, and they're going to get really just, you know, great, great, great talent. It's motivated people, people love to learn these things in their time. That's the kind, that's the kind of people they want to have there. It's going to, it's going to help in the, in the long run. Now, proving that, on the other hand, is is uh, much more difficult. I think that, that if you've established a relationship with someone, someone they can, you probably, probably tend to see some of these things. Have them post, have them post a job. Or F sharp develops develop versus you know full stack Java Java develops and see which see which one gets needs. It's probably going to be the F sharp one, and in a lot of, in a lot of places, it's probably going to be the F sharp one. Um, so I think the things that you can do, but I think there's a silver bullet. bullet the silver bullet would require that someone that these people trust and look up to, like a Microsoft, for example, come out and say this is the way to way to do things, and they would feel feel comfortable. Doing that. But lacking, lacking that, it, it just comes down to, you know, relationships. And also, I've seen this work, work in some companies. A developer went off and they did, did something in an, in an FP language and, and had a smashing success. And that just enabled them to grow. Like they got to, to hire more and more people and that just spread out right organic. So that does, does work as well. Is if, you, if you can prove it, if you're inside a company, you prove it to them, then you can grow. And, and if you have a relationship with people, then you can do that. 
And then also I've heard, heard of, um, I've heard, I've heard of some contractors they are saying, well, look, look, I can do for you, you know, it's going to take me two weeks. Or if you want to do Java, I'm happy to do, to do that. It's going to take you two, two months. <laughs> And by, by the way, it's, it's probably not going to work going to work quite as, as the Haskell one. And if, if you can qualify the amount of time or the number of bugs or anything like that, and, and you're willing to sort of stake your, your name on that, in other words, yes, this will be done in two, in two weeks. Let me use Has Haskell. Yeah, that's the scary the one. Manager will, they'll be like, yes, give me the two weeks one. <laughs> they can understand that. They can make those types of trade-offs, even if not deep tech technologies. Uh, I've never considered the latter part. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't make, don't make it two weeks or two months, but you could, you could be, okay, you know, two, two months with F sharp. And if you want to do it using, using C sharp, well, that's going to add 25% tax. You've got to write a whole, a whole lot more code and like it's, it's going to be a lot easier and to test more and so forth. Like I, I, I do think, I do think, do think they'll get, but the, the challenge is like, don't over promise. <laughs> yeah. What, what are, it may not work in a while. I don't see why it would not work. But what I would wish would happen, what would happen is if, how do I want to frame this? Um, let me try to use a poor illustration or example. I think there's times where like a government agency, maybe like DARPA, they will incentivize uh, universities or companies or whoever to they'll give them a challenge you know produce me this product or this this thing that i need and uh i'll give you some money to to get going and at the end i'll pick uh first place second place maybe it's just first and second whatever but and they have rounds i think i haven't done too much research but i think they have rounds where like maybe like 10, 10 organizations get invited and then like five of them qualify and then three of them, they get more money to continue. Uh, and then there's a winner that's selected, but then there's an opportunity for that winner to collaborate and partner with the runner ups, you know, to yeah. fill in the voids when that contract finally gets awarded. Yeah. Now that the government has a, never ending supply of money, even regardless of how much the taxpayers actually owe, right? Like, I mean, there's a deficit, but the government prints money. Exactly. I, I could be wrong, but I, I'm curious if there's any type of like pattern that could be adopted by corporations or, or startups where, okay, let's, let's take this requirement for a service or application and let's partition it into, you know, subsystems or, or domains. And let's just, let's hire one team that use this type of technology to build out this domain. That's a vertical slice, UI all the way to back end. Let's hire another team that uses a, um, I don't wanna say contrary, but a different paradigm of technologies, vertical slice. Um, these slices, need to be somewhat cl close when it comes to like complexity or scope. And let's just see how these people with these technologies perform. And then let's see, you know, how they deliver and the timeline that they deliver it in. I wish that, I, I would call that experimentation. I would yeah. call that, I mean, there's bias in there. Like you can't, some of it depends on the caliper, the caliper, ah. Yeah, the, the caliber of the practitioner, but yeah. I wish that there were more opportunities where like you can really experiment. And I think this is what the DevOps movement is about. I don't know too much about it, but I've listened to a couple audiobooks where like if you really want to figure out how much money you can save and how much money you can make as a result of reducing expenses, then why not test out exactly. different aspects of the services that you want to build and then after one or two, you know, experiments, like double down on it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that control, controlling it, you know, basically having different sort of independent green field projects. I think think that would be great, and it it, it would be even better if more like, well, <laughs> be more graceful. But it would be even better if the different teams were doing the same the same thing, 
Um, um, so the exact same thing you have, you have all the different teams of all their different, all their different approaches, basically doing the exact same thing without, without consulting each other in any way. Cause then you're controlling for one, one more thing. Um, and I wish the government, someone would fund stuff, stuff like that, because if you think about it, like, like what could show that FP could cut down bugs by, I don't know, 10% or like if it could make. That if it could reduce the cost of adding a change to a five million dollar color code base by twenty percent, well, well, then suddenly looking at ten billions, hundreds of billions in savings means that's huge. That's monu monumental, and companies would very much like to know the, the answer to these questions, but no one's willing to to fund the research necessary to, to figure out about how how they're answered. Yeah, they just spend all that money fixing it and debugging. Right. <laughs> they don't acknowledge that. They don't acknowledge that. I, I will still say that 80% of, and I could be wrong, but my personal experience is like 80% of the budget is on manually debugging something that could have been automated. And um, yeah. Huge source of waste. And like I've, I've, in every project that I've worked on, it's big enough. Uh, half, half stuff, they have their, their QA team, right? They have their QA team. And, Half of all the developers, all they spend their time doing is fixing bugs. Fixing bugs. Yeah. Just bug, bug after bug after bug, bug. That's that's the art in our industry is half, half, half of you spend cleaning up mistakes made at the other half. <laughs> I wrote a blog post that had got a little bit of visibility. The title was profession. It was, are you a professional debugger? And it was essentially saying that, you know, do you spend most of your time like writing code and, and, and shipping it? Or you just, do you spend the majority of your time, AKA the, the customer's budget, um, troubleshooting it manually, right? Um, and after you find that fix, what do you do? Do you just check it in? Or do you write an automated test to make sure that it never ever happens again, at least with that specific example, right? We're not even talking about property-based tests. Um, and that was out of frustration with working with one shop. But, right, because if you don't have unit, units, then I imagine, like you say, it's probably eighty percent or more. Yeah, I, the companies where where I've sixty percent, then because they have lots of lots of tests <laughs> that they got that low. <laughs> I could easily yeah. see if 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 they're if they're not, if they're not testing stuff and it's manual queue for everything being around us, yeah. I could see that being eighty percent. That's just because of customer money at that point, I think. But, but the customer doesn't know it. No. Right? If the customer. <laughs> If the customer, uh, and I'll conclude in a little bit, if the customer were to hover over a, a developer's shoulder yeah. and, and observe their workflow of, of how they're building out their, their products, and the customer were to observe that every single time they were to test that the latest bit of code works, that they literally have to launch the entire application, put the application to a specific state that takes another like several seconds or minutes, and then step through the debugger and hover the mouse over some value, get a data tip, drill, expand that data tip to get to some element of that of that list. Like it was like you're fired. Like <laughs> I pay you to program. Why are you not automating this? But people, the biggest issue is people just don't know what goes into building sustainable systems. So, John, I really appreciate you taking the hour to to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not been a pleasure. It's about you, but <laughs> been a pleasure to get to know you more and learn about what you're up to, it. and hopefully vice versa. Yeah. Are, are there any uh, call to actions or any recommendations in general for people that want to get better at, at helping others that you would recommend? Uh, I think one of the best ways that there is, there is right now to help people. Is to uh, write blog posts <laughs> like you're doing and like others others are doing. Just find something that you're interested in or that you want to learn about and talk, talk about it. Write about it because everyone has a different way of explaining things. And also, if you're new to some, to something, you're probably going to see it in a, in a different way than some than some are experienced. And you may be able to commun communicate things that a very experienced person would just forget. So I so I say you know write blog blog posts if you can or or um. Speaking at conferences and meetups, meetups are desperate for content. They're they're looking for people who are willing to explain things, and there there are, there definitely is there there are a lot out there who want to learn. 
and their, their, their bottles in their ability to learn. And if you can help make it easier by condensing something into a blog post or into a talk, a con conference talk, meetup talk, talk, can help enormously. And if you do, do if you're on open source, just, just be able to get people to help you out can be enormously beneficial. Honestly, I learned a lot from studying other code and doing pull requests and having my code checked active in pull requests. That's a big way of the, the, that you can personally help others and that they can help you just by reviewing, reviewing each other's code. And open, open source is a great way to, way to do that and to build something, something useful that maybe scratches a, a personal itch that you have. And it's something that you can add to the resume. Doing open source work, work can help career in, in, in many, many ways, I think. Sounds good. Yeah, my, my uh, blog posts, they're really just brain dumps. Like, I went from writing five paragraph essays to now I just, I just throw code in there just so I can remember it next time and that's it. And I end up visiting it like months afterwards. A lot of people JIT post, like um, just on GitHub, they just dump some, some stuff in a few comments. But you know, some, of, some of it widely read and it helps. Um, and it helps. Yeah, I, I will say that there's something that I did uh, learn from you. Um, there, was, there was someone's podcast that I heard you on and you were, I think you were purposely being controversial, but you, I think you were making an argument of if your if your function names are too long, then you're doing something wrong. Yes. Uh, it, it, it was something to that effect, and yeah. I listened to the whole thing. And I think your argument was, and feel free to correct me, but I think your argument was if your method, if your function names are too long, then you're not leveraging um, like generics. Yeah. As, as much as you should. And I took that to heart and I revisited the the code that I was working on. And like I was saying earlier, like I'll identify all the core operations for a given domain. And I may have like, I may have like 10 or a dozen, yeah. uh, re regardless of if that's too many or not, whatever. And so I started applying what you said and I said, okay, let me, let me try to, I don't even know what the name is, genericize it. Whatever the formal name for making it generic, yeah. that's what I did. And um, I realized that, and I guess this is what category theory is leading to. I'm not sure because I still don't understand category theory. But when I when I attempted to apply your 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 recommendations, I went from like a dozen core operations as function type signatures to like four or five. Wow, oh, that's and, powerful. Yeah, and, and so those were the function type declarations. And then my my actual function implementations, like they, within F-sharp, you can say that it outputs this function type, right? Just like yeah. it can output a type. And um, and I just provided the, the actual data types uh, for the, that, generic function signature and it, it reduced the code significantly. So nice. thanks for that. Yeah. Still don't know what category be, theory is, but I think it has something to do with the reduction of of declarations or something. Yeah, there's it's, there's it's patterns like, of functions that you could just leverage. Yeah, without. trying to find the patterns in the pat patterns. What's the what's what can you throw away? Category theory is all about, all about throwing away as much as possible and finding patterns in the pattern patterns. It's very powerful. Yeah. But also, also not necessary to be a functional programmer. So, yeah. well, John, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Absolutely, and, uh, thank you. And good um, luck with your, your Oops project. That should, that should. Yeah, well, that's a proof of concept. I, uh, I'm, I'm considering using that, and then being able to have enough infrastructure or framework to stamp out a. A mobile front end and back end and 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 sell a subscription model to like mom and pop shops that mm -hmm. rely on delivery, whether it's dry cleaning, snow plowing, or or restaurants. So mm -hmm. it's a project I'm going to learn a lot on, especially as I continue to try to mature my skill set. But uh, thank you for your contributions. And like I said, that was a prime example of something that you recommended that I tried, and it got me a little bit closer to understanding category theory. But I still don't know what a monad is. But <laughs> you will. 
Yeah. This time next year, year, you'll know. Or at least as well as anyone knows. <laughs> Just uh, not very well. All right, thanks so. a lot. I'm hitting the stop broadcast button.